So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land where this video is being made, the Ghana people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and also to the future generations to come. I'd also like to respectfully thank them for the opportunity to be here on their country and sharing my work with you all. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that this video may travel to, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future generations of those lands. So before I share my innovation project, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and my work context, just to give you a better understanding of my project and how it came about. Uh, I'm from a small Aboriginal community in Northern Territory called Tennant Creek, and I'm currently living and working in Brisbane as a social and emotional wellbeing counsellor. And I work for an organisation owned and operated by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and we offer free counselling and mental health support to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Brisbane region. Um, my role is primarily working with female youth between the ages of 13 to 18, but I also work with women between the ages of 19 to 35, all of which identify as Aboriginal and all from many different backgrounds. So as a social emotional wellbeing counsellor, we use a holistic approach, which is a view of health traditionally owned by Aboriginal people. So I wanted to create a tool that uses narrative practices to continue to explore their social, emotional, physical, mental and spiritual well-being. Um, because Aboriginal people are often put in a position of being subjugated from systems that we work alongside of, by removing the colonising practices from our organisation, this enables us to achieve our goal to provide and further develop culturally appropriate counselling responses to enhance the health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So being Aboriginal myself, I have in the past struggled to remain in a decentered position and find ways to engage with my people that didn't focus on the problem saturated accounts of their lives and their communities. This was because of my own insider knowledge I hold of being, hold being of the collective experience and history of Aboriginal people. Uh, Talia Drum Butler also offers her own explanation of being of the collective experience. So while having an awareness of this insider knowledge, this has helped me to remain in what Michael White calls a decentered and influential position in guiding the conversations and asking questions which centres the clients as the expert of their lives. This insider knowledge of particular experiences does, however, give me a better understanding of the needs of Aboriginal people who seek support. Um, some of the children I work with who seek support have experienced family, domestic or racial violence, drug and alcohol misuse, bullying, grief and loss, trauma by the mistreatment of mainstream social or child services, growing up in foster care and even experiencing some form of abuse in that care. Some of these young people also have very little cultural influences or connections in their lives. So being empowered by a quote by Cathy Owen from Towards Theories of Maori Feminists in Feminist Voices, Women's Studies Text for Aotearoa, New Zealand, I wanted my innovation project to also contribute to removing the fear and distrust in Aboriginal children and young people the fear of being reported to other services, the fear of being judged and labelled, the fear of not being understood or not taken seriously. And by removing this fear and distrust, help remove the stigma surrounding the words counselling and therapy, therefore encouraging people to seek help. To also create an indigenised counselling setting and process for Aboriginal children to respond to and build resilience and resistance against social and cultural problems such as racism, drug and alcohol misuse, intergenerational trauma, family and domestic violence, and to also encourage children and young people to develop cultural strengths, understandings and cultural expression. My innovation project was inspired by the Tree of Life methodology and my idea came to mind when myself and two other master students assisted David in the delivery of the Tree of Life in Adelaide back in June this year. During the workshop I wondered how I could adapt a similar concept and narrative approach as the Tree of Life, which still focuses on a holistic and non-blaming approach and still offers a creative way of sharing their stories and experiences. So while I was thinking about my innovative idea, I really connected to one of the 25 Indigenous projects from Linda Smith's book, Decolonising Methodologies, which was number 25 called Creating. This made me think about Aboriginal art and how it's been a way of communicating for Aboriginal people for thousands of years. In the past, I've often used art collage in my practice as it allows me to work alongside clients in a way that doesn't invite me to interpret what my clients are doing or saying, 
but instead supports my curiosity and co-research position, aligning with the work of David Epstein in exploring how they make sense of their experiences. However, I wanted to create something that was more personal to them, something that belongs to Aboriginal people and something that they can really own in the counselling room and therefore giving our people back the power to be the experts of their own lives and communities. So with all things considered, I developed a culture-specific tool that uses Aboriginal art and narrative practices to support Aboriginal children and young people in a one-on-one -on -one setting. I've named this tool My Meeting Place. My Meeting Place offers a non-invasive way to give my people back their voices to safely express their experiences and stories through art and also allows Aboriginal practitioners to be able to continue engaging with Aboriginal people who are seeking help in culturally respectful conversations. <coughs> For my meeting place, I chose a few common Aboriginal symbols. These symbols can look slightly different depending on the region or community a person comes from, but they can also have the same or similar meanings. However, out of respect to the different communities, if the people um, I'm using my meeting place with are aware of the symbols from their community or region, they are welcomed and encouraged to share their cultural knowledge and use their symbols and any others. Given that I work with children, it was also important to offer them a light-hearted and playful approach to counselling. I hope that by using my meeting place it gives them many options to help stretch their minds and invite them to uncover significant experiences and moments that have been buried underneath the dominant stories of their lives. So the symbols I'm using in my meeting place are these that represent a journey path, a person, a rainbow, rain, a campsite or waterhole as their meeting place and a star. I chose these symbols to make it simple enough for children to be able to participate. Because counselling can already be quite intimidating for young people, especially children, I felt it was important not to use symbols that were difficult to draw because this could create a sense of failure should they not be able to draw them. So putting all these symbols together, I created this map as a starting point. We have the stars, the, rain, the rainbow, three journey paths that will lead to my meeting place and the people sitting around my meeting place. The areas in between the journey paths I like to refer to as land or country. Before I go on, I'd like to mention also that because this tool asks people to write the names of people, I would let them know that if they can't write the names due to cultural reasons, then they are welcome to use initials or images or colours to represent people instead. Uh, this is important to acknowledge this to ensure that I continue to provide a safe and culturally respectful place. So I'd now like to take you through each section of my meeting place to show you the different areas that we explore. As I go through each section of my meeting place, I want to share small snippets of conversations between myself and a young Aboriginal woman I've been engaging with, just to give you a clearer example of how I facilitated my meeting place and the narrative practices used in order to achieve particular outcomes. I'd also just like to point out that the names have been changed to protect my client's identity. Uh, just to give you a quick introduction, Kiara is a teenage mother of one child and she reached out for support because she often felt lost and that if she were to keep feeling like this then it would affect her daughter. This then had Kiara worried about being a bad mother. So she also spoke about growing up in foster care with a non-Indigenous family and not really knowing her biological family and therefore didn't know much about her culture as she stated. Not knowing much about her culture also contributed to her feeling lost. So Kiara's worries during, so sorry. So hearing Kiara's worries during my first visit to her home, I noticed an Aboriginal painting hanging on her wall. I queried who painted it, and she said she did. To me, this was a clear connection to her culture. However, remaining decentered, I was curious to know more about her paintings, and her not knowing much about her culture, as she put it. So I held on to this unique outcome and thought this might be a good time to introduce my meeting place. I asked Kiara if she would be interested to explore her journeys with me in a more visual way. So I thought this would help to see if we could make any other possible connections which may not have been visible to her before. When I first meet with children or young people, I like to ask them what counselling means to them and what their experiences with counselling have been like. I do this to get some sort of understanding of their expectations or notions of what counselling is. I then explain to them that my job is to support them on their healing journey and one of the ways I like to do this is with my meeting place. I then explain that I use my meeting place to help us explore many different things about their life. I also tell them that they can talk about their concerns when they feel ready. The reason I explain all of this is to try and relieve any pressure and so that they can enjoy the experience. 
So after Kiara agreed to, to try my meeting place, I did a quick sketch of this map and asked her how she felt about drawing her own, which she was happy to do. I then told her that I would be doing this alongside her. I think it's important to, to also acknowledge the reason why I chose to do this alongside the children and young people I work with. Reason being is because of my awareness of the privilege and power of my role as a counsellor, which can already be intimidating for some people. So by doing this alongside them also takes the pressure and focus of them and makes the experience less daunting as opposed to me sitting there and watching them do it. So with our maps drawn, we started. So we started at the first journey path, which represents my cultural heritage. This is where I asked Kiara to write down her tribes, skins, clans, totems, dreaming, her ancestry and languages she speaks or language groups, family names and important or significant family members. While Kiara was writing about her cultural heritage, I asked her what she had included and she started rattling off family names. So I asked her about a particular name she mentioned and she said it was her father's name. I asked her if she had a story she would like to share with me about him and she said that she had only met her real dad once when she was very young and that years ago her auntie told her that he was the one who named her and that her tr name is a traditional Aboriginal word meaning the moon. Um, so hearing this unique outcome, I wanted to scaffold a line of inquiry to undermine the problem story of her not knowing much about her culture. So I asked her the following questions. I'm curious to know how it makes you feel knowing that you have a traditional Aboriginal name. Having your auntie share this knowledge with you, I'm wondering what that's made possible for you. Would you mind sharing with me why it's important for you to have this cultural knowledge to pass on to your daughter? And to further explain and thicken her alternative story, I asked, you said earlier that you don't really know your father, so knowing that he named you, what does this mean for you? And you mentioned that because your father named you, you now feel a bit of a connection with your dad. I'm just wondering if having a connection with your dad is important to you and why? After exploring her cultural heritage, we moved on to the second journey path, which represents where my journey began. This is where I invite Kiara to write down where she was born, where she grew up, where she lives now, people she grew up with, people who looked after her or raised her, significant landmarks, pets or animals from where she was born or grew up. I asked Kiara who she grew up with and she told me she was placed with a foster family, which was her foster mum who had four sons and a daughter and their nan. I asked her what that was like for her growing up with her foster family and she said it was hard that her foster family were all white or non-Indigenous um, and that her foster mum was also using speed and ice and had different boyfriends and there was a lot of fighting during that time. I asked Kiara if she would like to talk about this a bit more and she agreed. Hearing her experience in foster care, I wanted to map the effects of this new problem but also explore the landscape of action to look for alternative storylines. So I asked the following questions. I'm just wondering what effects the fighting and your foster mum's drug use had on yourself and your brothers and sisters during that time. And when your brothers and sisters were frightened, would they be by themselves or what would they do? How would you know to look after them during those times? From hearing how you look after your brothers and sisters, it sounds like you're a good carer. I'm just wondering if being a good carer fits with you or would you call it something else? Were there any other experiences back then or now that provoked you wanting to care for them? By scaffolding these questions, Kiara was able to see these events as being a carer for her brothers and sisters. Building on her response to this, I asked, I'm just curious to know what you think your brothers and sisters thought or saw in you that they appreciated during those times. If your brothers and sisters were here with us today, what do you think they would say to you? So when we finished our conversations about her, where her journey began, we moved on to the stars, which represents my spiritual connections. This is where I asked Kiara to describe her spiritual connections she may have to the environment or special places of hers, ceremonies or cultural sites, landmarks, as well as people, animals that have passed but are with her in spirit, or people or significant animals that guide her. Also, any dreams she considers being a spiritual connection. Our spiritual connections are not limited to, to what I have named here, but these are a few examples. For Aboriginal people, spiritual connections are an important aspect of our culture. So because, oh sorry, yeah. Uh, so because we had begun to counteract her idea that she didn't know much about her culture, I wanted to explore her spiritual connection to see if we could unearth any new, unique outcomes that could contribute to her cultural knowledge. 
I asked Kiara if she has any stories or experiences that she would like to share and she proceeded to tell me that even though she'd grown up in Brisbane and never been back to her birthplace, that she's always felt the urge to go back there, like it's calling me back there, as she put it. To learn more of Kiara's experience, I then asked, so would you call that a spiritual connection or how would you describe it? Do you have a story or image that comes to mind when you think about this spiritual connection? So from these questions, Kiara showed me a painting she did that represented her spiritual connection to her birthplace, which was a significant unique outcome in the face of the problem story. After Kiara had shared her spiritual connections with me, we moved on to Land Country Area 4, which represents other significant connections I've made on my journeys. This is where I invite Kiara to talk about significant connections she's made with specific dates, seasons, items, inspirational people, or characters or places. When I asked Kiara what other significant connections she'd made on her journey, she said definitely with art. Drawing on Ani Bal Wingard's writings to support Kiara to tell her stories in ways that make her stronger, I asked Kiara the following questions. What has making a connection with art made possible for you over the years? Can I ask when you started painting, did you teach yourself or did someone else teach you? And have you done any other paintings? From this last question in particular, Kiara told me about information she received from her non-Indigenous foster nan, which suggests to her that because Kiara is light-skinned and didn't grow up with her Aboriginal family, she might be offending other Aboriginal people by doing Aboriginal paintings. So Kiara stopped painting. As I mentioned earlier, being aware of my own insider knowledge which supported me in thinking about this as an abuse of her nan's position of power or privilege in Kiara's life, to in fact suppress her cultural expression. So to introduce decolonizing practices, I asked. So I'm curious to know who it is you might be offending. Was it that, what was it that worried you about offending other Aboriginal people? Being Aboriginal yourself, I'm just curious to know how or what things you do to express your cultural connection. So this line of inquiry supported Kiara to know that her art is in fact her cultural connection and cultural expression. To thicken the story even more, I asked, just hearing you say you were worried about offending other Aboriginal people makes me wonder what that says you value or is important to you. So we mapped the landscape of identity. After learning about other significant connections Kiara had made on her journeys, we moved over to land or country area five, which represents what I've learned or achieved on my journeys. This is where I asked Kiara to write about her personal skills, strengths and values, things she'd learnt or are important to her, things she's good at or personal interests of hers. Using Michael White's ideas of editorialising, we summed up her skills she had discovered on her previous journey paths and she wrote about being a good carer for her younger siblings and the importance of family. She wrote about her love for art and her daughter and dreams she has for her, hopes and hopes she has for her family and much more. To further editorialise, I said to Kiara, I said, so Kiara, during our conversations, you told me about your Aboriginal name and the meaning of it. You told me about your birthplace and tribe you're from and your connection with art and about the Aboriginal paintings you do. So I guess this has got me curious to know, does what you say about not knowing much about your culture still fit with you? What do you think about that? And how does that make you feel to know that you have all this knowledge of your culture? So through the narrative questions that took place, Kiara was able to reauthor the story of her life that was congruent with her preferred identity. We then moved on to Journey Path 6, which represents my future direction. This is where Kiara wrote about hopes and wishes she has for herself, others and her community, things she may want to do in the future, places she may want to visit, dreams or goals she has, or ways she would like to contribute to others or her community, even things she might want to learn. Kiara spoke about her dreams to reconnect with her family, especially her dad and her auntie. Her dream about going back to her birthplace and taking her daughter as well. She spoke about her hopes for her daughter's future and spoke of a holiday they're planning to her partner's homeland of New Zealand. She also spoke about wanting to be a primary school teacher and the edu education she wants for herself. After many discussions of the different areas of my meeting place, I created space to talk about the rain, which represents a difficult time or problems people are facing or have faced on their journeys. This can be a problem, a loss, worries or illness. The problems do not need to be physically recorded on here, however this gives an opportunity to be able to externalise problems, map the histories of these problems and to acknowledge the effects that these problems have had on their journeys. 
My intention for my intentions for this is also to sorry. My intentions for this is also to not disregard their experiences, even the difficult times, but to help them understand that they are not passive recipients to these situations and to honour their abilities during those times. Kiara shared with me that years ago she used to self-harm or use cutting behaviour as she described it. So to learn more about this I asked Kiara questions such as, when did the cutting first make its appearance in your life? What effect did cutting have on your relationship with your partner? Were there times when the cutting was at its strongest or weakest? After Kiara had decentered the cutting in her life, we then moved on to the rainbow, which represents an image of the rain or problems that have passed. Through externalising the problems and the discussions about the rain or difficult times in Kiara's life, she spoke about how she overcame the difficulty when she realised she was pregnant with her daughter. To thicken her story more, I asked, by, re by realising you were pregnant, this helped you to overcome the cutting. I'm curious to know what that says about what you value. After hearing this, it also has me wondering what you think this says about you as a parent. If your daughter was here with us and heard you speak of how she helped you get through this difficult time in your life, what do you think she would say to you? Is this strength something that you want to pass on to your daughter? After hearing this, I'm curious to know if you think being a bad mother still fits with you. What do you think about that? During this conversation, Kiara had contradicted and overshadowed the worry or self-accusation of being a bad mother and therefore managed to avoid embracing this problem-saturated definition of herself. We then came to the last section, which is my meeting place. This represents who they want to invite to be with them at their meeting place. It also represents where they are now or their life now and who is with them, supporting them, caring for them, guiding them. This is where they can include important or significant people, pets, past or present, to sit with them at their meeting place. The people at their meeting place represents unity, support and connection. With this, I want people to be able to acknowledge the important people in their lives and know that they are not alone and that they are important and contribute to other people's lives as well. When I asked Kiara about who she would like to invite to be with her at her meeting place, she wrote the names of her daughter, her partner, mother and father and auntie. She also included her foster family and many more. When I asked Kiara why it was important to invite these people to sit with her at her meeting place, she spoke about how much they had taught her and what they all meant to her and her daughter. She also said she could imagine the joking and laughter at her meeting place if they were all there with her. This is usually where I finish up with my meeting place, however over the last week I've been thinking about extending this a little further with the option for Kiara to write a letter to the people she invites to her meeting place to explain to them why she has invited them and to document the contributions people have made to her life. Whether she sends it or not is entirely up to her. So as I mentioned earlier this is a starting point and the themes or ideas are not limited to what I have here. I just want to remind you that the examples given are just a few of the many elements of narrative practice used with my meeting place. Also using my meeting place as a guide for shaping narrative conversations made possible for me to co-research alongside Kiara to create second story development and reveal the multi-stories of her life and thus create alternative storylines of her preferred identity. We were also able to elicit her insider knowledge and survival skills of the hard times and how she is passing these skills and knowledge on to her daughter. Kiara said she enjoyed doing my meeting place and would like to do it with her daughter sometime because she liked the way it uses Aboriginal art. She liked how it made her think of things she, would not, she wouldn't really have thought about before. She also appreciated that the experience made her feel comfortable talking about things compared to other counselling experiences she's had. What my meeting place had made possible for me when engaging with young people or children is it's given them more control in the counselling session but still giving us both an active role. By using these symbols, I hope that this will make the experience more meaningful for the people I work with. I hope that by doing this, it also gives children and young people more of a connection to culture within the counselling room. To finish up, I'd just like to acknowledge that the symbols used in my meeting place belong to the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. I'd also like to remind or encourage non-Aboriginal practitioners to continue to respect cultural protocols when thinking of ways to engage with Aboriginal people. Thank you for listening.